Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, mapping genomes. That's our first of a couple of lectures. We're going to talk about the, uh, well, laying out all of the elements that are in our genomes. Uh, we, in Chapter 2, talked about how to study genomes, how to study DNA anyway, and so we proceed. How do you map genomes? Where we're headed, um, DNA elements and markers. Uh, we're going to explain down the road why maps are essential and then briefly review sort of the math underlying uh, how to map. So that's based on the idea of language analysis. And if you can recall from your uh, first semester in genetics, the linkage analysis is based on the idea that DNA elements are located in the genome and some of them may be closely linked to each other and others may be farther away located farther away from each other. And so knowing that information allows you through following recombination events to basically figure out which elements are close and which elements are far. Okay, we'll talk about the different kinds of mapping techniques and then we'll conclude with some examples of maps. So like the restriction fragment linked polymorphisms that, and the uh, short tandem repeat maps SDS maps. Okay. So first we're going to talk a little bit about and remind you about what genomic elements are. And we'll begin our mapping discussion by talking about, you know, how to think about organizing chromosomes or how to organize our idea about the genome into chromosomes. 3.3 billion base pairs in the human genome but it's not one great big DNA molecule, right? It's packaged into chromosomes. Chromosomes are single molecules of DNA. They can range in size, okay? And of course, chromosomes are, are DNA, but they're also protein. And so you should recall that the proteins are histones. How big are our chromosomes? Chromosome one is the largest. Chromosome 22 is the smallest. This is the number of bases, millions of bases, 249 million base pairs. The Y chromosome is, is small also, but it's not the smallest. Chromosome 22 is. Okay, other things that you should recall about mapping in genomes, we can map chromosomes and show them in what's called an ideogram. And so some things that we would know about chromosomes is that they all have a centromere that's just a DNA sequence. They all have telomeres, if we're talking about eukaryotic chromosomes, right? Linear, so telomeres are found at the ends. Mammals all have the same repeated telomere sequence, TTA, GGG. And other things associated with chromosomes, of course, the nucleolus, the an organelle, and if you stain it, you'll find that it's rich in RNA. So it's, okay, uh, this is not an ideogram, this is some raw data. So uh, how you do karyotyping is, well, you gotta get chromosomes. And so when is the best time to get chromosomes? And that's when the cells are in metaphase because of course that's the time in which the chromosomes come together and condense. And so a trick is to use uh, an agent called colsonid. It's found in fungus, mushroom. And it's uh, the, the purified version of this is used in uh, some chemotherapy, actually. But what it does is that you have growing cells. You've got to be using growing cells. And what instead of going through the complete uh, mitosis, they arrest in metaphase. And so that increases the number of cells that you have that the cell the chromosomes are condensed and in metaphase. So this is uh, uh, some work we did in my lab a couple years back, and so the cell line we're working with is an immortal cell line, so that means it doesn't show the hay flick limit. It just keeps growing and growing and growing, going from one cell to two cells, provided you feed it properly, right? And so it's a little hard to show, but this is through our, our karyotype software, and we came up with a haploid count of 39, okay? And so, not haploid, that should say 2N. Sorry, that's diploid. 
you would think I'd go back and change that slide, all right? So the, the, the haploid count is 21, so we're missing a couple of chromosomes. And so this is one of the, the, the uh, typical kind of observations when you're using immortalized cell lines. Often, not always, but often they're derived from uh, tumors. And so one of the things that you see in cancer is irregular karyotypes. And so when you, make, when you work on immortalized cell lines, it's important to remember that they're not necessarily good models of normal cells. And so one evidence from this is we have a different karyotype for the cell line that we worked with. Okay, so let's get back to uh, how can we use uh, uh, mapping evidence of mapping, what can we use that for? And so this is an example. Uh, if we go to the NCBI genome decoration page, you can get uh, images of, of a number of uh, karyotypes for different species with the banding patterns. Okay, another site that you can go to, to to link to that information is the NCBI taxonomy browser. So if you're interested in like dogs, you can just type in dogs and click on the search and up would pop various information about it. And so one of the things I just did for fun was to go ahead and do karyotypes for the different uh, organisms. Ow, look down there, I did it again. So there's 38 and 78, that's not the haploid, that's the diploid. Anyway, my point being, so here's humans, chimpanzees, orangutans, gibbons. So there's four different genera of gibbons and they differ by their karyotype. Macaques, uh, rhesus macaque is a common organism used in, in medical research. Of course, the house mouse. And so this would be 19. Cats have 19 in the haploid. Dogs have, what is that, 39 in the haploid. And what I'm trying to suggest here is that there isn't a simple relationship between number of chromosomes and something more interesting like organismal complexity. Complexity is not a good word. It, what do you mean by complex? But certainly, however you define it, humans are more complicated than a mouse. So there's a difference of three chromosomes, right? But I would say, uh, although cats might disagree, we're not much more complicated than a cat. Yeah, we are. Okay, so we have a few more here, but we certainly are more complicated than a gibbon and they have more than us, okay? So there isn't a simple relationship, and this would have been a better graph if I got my data right. Okay, so other kinds of, of ways that molecular or, or genetic maps can be used is evidence to test hypotheses through uh, evolutionary hypotheses, for example, so comparative kinds of tests. So Darwin's famous uh, uh, summary of what he meant by evolution is the idea that generation after generation after generation, of course there's heredity, but there's modifications, we now call them mutations, and these are inherited as well. And so uh, organisms today are linked through history, through repeated generation after generation after generation of inheritance, but variation has been introduced. And so it, it imposes then what's called a nested hierarchy about relationships among organisms that are alive today. Those that we think are closely related, like the bonobo chimp and the regular chimpanzee, um, they seem to have evolved from each other just in the last couple million years, okay? So we would expect if you look at the karyotypes and look at the banding patterns of the chromosomes, we'd expect them to be quite similar compared to looking at humans versus chimpanzees. Evolution history goes back somewhere about eight, six to eight million years ago is where the split is, and so on and so forth, so that we would compare our karyotypes and the banding patterns between humans and gibbons, and you'd expect quite a few differences, right? So how does this sort of fall out when you look at it? And so one of the interesting things, uh, this is, the great apes, so this is going to take a little while to explain. So this is a, an old x-ray uh, image of karyotypes aligned in the different uh, great apes. So the, on the left, that's the human 
Next to that, that's the chimpanzee. Next to that one, that's the gorilla. And then the, the fourth and last one is the orangutan. So what you're supposed to get here is, well, well the, the links are the same, kind of same, 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 okay? And it's hard to see this, but you know, other kinds of research bear this out. The banding patterns line up pretty well, too, with the exception of something here, our chromosome 2. Notice chromosome 2 is our second largest chromosome, and the implication people are aligning two chromosomes from chimpanzee, two chromosomes from gorilla, two chromosomes from the orangutan as the closest match to our chromosome 2. So, something fascinating going on about our chromosome 2. So how can we explain this? Uh, great apes have 24 chromosomes. We're the only exception. We have 23. So through our evolution, when we last shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees, again going back 68 million years ago, there was a split. And so what is the hypothesis to explain why we have 23 and all of the other great apes have 24? Well, one hypothesis is, is that chromosome 2 was simply lost in our ancestor leading to humans. Additional evidence for that would be we would predict then that looking at those that extra chromosome in chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, that they'd have about a thousand more genes than us. Right? So loss of chromosome is one hypothesis for why we went, we see 23 instead of 24. Um, but what that predicts then is a certain kind of molecular, molecular evidence that we would need to then check. Are we in fact missing a thousand genes compared to chimpanzees? So that's one hypothesis for why 23 and not 24, the loss chromosome hypothesis. The other hypothesis, and that's what's detailed on this page, is the idea that uh, leading up to us, our ancestors, there was a fusion of two chromosomes from the great apes, our ancestor great apes, right? So what would be the evidence in favor of that? Well, substantial uh, uh, banding in common, that's one, but the other would be it predicts that we would find an a centromere sequences in our chromosome two where there isn't supposed to be a centromere, but also proposes that we would find telomere sequences in our chromosome two where they shouldn't have been, right? So let's take a look at that. This is a, an image of our chromosome two on the left, and then the two chromosomes, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, and so you can see the banding patterns line up pretty well. There's our centromere, there's our cent the chimp centromere for this chromosome, okay? And then here's the end of that chromosome, and the chromosome, so we have regions in here where we would expect to find telomere sequences. A little bit better represented on this image is here's that centromere, okay? And that's region on our chromosome two that has centromere-like sequences. So at any rate, the point being is that um, the fusion hypothesis is supported by uh, additional molecular evidence the lost chromosome hypothesis is not supported. We have the same number of genes. Uh, actually, we have a few more genes than, than chimpanzees do, and there are some differences in the kinds of genes that are present, although not many, but a few, and of course those are very interesting to us. Um, and this is not to say that there's, you know, over the course of the genome that there's just this, you know, overwhelming mess uh, information similarity so there's large changes in chromosomes but chromosome 2 is interesting because it seems to be our chromosome 2 seems to be the result of an ancient fusion event if you're interested in this kind of stuff there's there's a lot of articles on this this is now getting to be a little old, old but this is sort of the foundational argon, article Ventura genome research okay so let's move back to our DNA element story. So just as a reminder, DNA elements are, are uh, uh, a way of talking about what's in the genome. So 
we define them as sequences that we can recognize words. So genes are clearly DNA elements. And then the additional part about this story about DNA elements is to recognize that large DNA elements will be then made up of smaller DNA elements. So for example, our coding genes, those that code for proteins, are made up of domains and motifs. Non-coding genes that yield functional RNAs will also then be made up of motifs. Other non-coding elements just for the laundry list here, transposable elements, regulatory sequences, telomeres, satellites. So from this list you should be able to tell me which of these are functional. They have purpose for us. So regulatory sequences, definitely. Telomeres, definitely. Transposable elements, no. Satellites, no. All right. Domain definition. Your book gives a partial definition. So the complete is the idea that, yes, it causes the protein to fold. Okay, so it's a DNA sequence that when it's translated uh, provides instructions for how the protein should fold. But it, it, moreover, it provides information about function, okay? And it's independent, so you can remove the domain and put it into another protein sequence, and that protein will then gain that function. Examples, PDZ uh, is a signaling protein domain. Uh, it helps the protein bind to membranes. It's an ancient motif. It's been around for over a billion years, pretty much all life on the planet has this element. Zinc fingers, another famous one, so it, it obviously involves the protein grabs up some zinc, um, but you'll find these in the transcription factors. Those are of course proteins that they're part of their job is to bind to DNA sequence. Again, find them in all kinds of life on the planet. Ancient protein domain. My favorite because its name is actually Deathfold. So that says something about me, I suppose. But these are found in proteins that are involved in apoptosis. For example, caspases. All right. Motifs, your book doesn't define them, unfortunately. But that's, a, again, a short conserved region in a protein. Conserved means what? It means that other species, you'll find the same sequences. So conserved, we're typically meaning that it's a comparison among different species and you find that the sequence is largely the same. Mo motifs are frequently highly conserved parts of domains. Okay, so we have domains and then we have motifs within domains. Motifs can either be structural, meaning that they provide instruction for how the protein is going to fold, or it can be a sequence, a pattern. So this is a website that allows you to sort of search through sequence motifs and some of the motifs, structural motifs, have characteristic uh, 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 information, if you will. The proteins will end up having a, a hairpin, a beta hairpin, or what's called a Greek key, or an omega loop, or a helix turn helix. So it provides instructions for a 3D arrangement of the proteins. When we talk about the proteome, we'll go back to talking about structural motifs and domains in more detail. Okay, so what I want to conclude with is just a, an introduction to classifying, uh, if you will, a taxonomy of our genome. So we have these, these words, DNA elements, and so the next thing to do is say, okay, so we can recognize these. Let's now arrange them in terms of quantity. How common are these different DNA elements? So remember that our human genome is comprised of the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome. We won't talk in great detail right now about the mitochondrial, but uh, three ribosomal RNA genes, 22 transfer RNA genes, and then 13 coding genes. Not a lot of non-coding, non-functional genes or DNA sequences in the mitochondrial. Then getting back to our, so the, the, I don't have the size here, I should list that. So the mitochondrial genome 
is just a little over 16,000 base pairs long. So compared to the nuclear genome, it's tiny. Our nuclear genome is 3.3 billion base pairs long, again, arranged in the 23 chromosomes. If you were to add up all of those nucleotides and say how many are involved in genes, you'd be surprised. Very, very few base pairs are found in genes. About 3% of that 3.3 billion. Now that's still a pretty huge number, right? And the genes then are arranged in either a single copy or they may be part of gene families. And some other little details about how we get there about this. But the point is, is that only about 3% of the genome are what we would consider our genes. And so this is one of the uh, important little messages for going from high school biology to, to college uh, genetics is the idea that th the genome is an enormously large, complicated uh, living memory, if you will, of our ancestry. And only a fraction of it, though, are the things that we need to make us. And so this is a really active area of research trying to figure out, is it really true that only about 3% of our genome is essential? Okay, so obviously we have some work to do, right? So 3%, then the rest, 97%, these are some of the types of DNA elements. Repetitive sequences. So these can be you know, a word that's, that's written, if you will, over and over and over again. And that r word can be tandem, repeated one after the other, satellites being examples, or those elements can be repeated but scattered throughout the genome, so interspersed. Then the other class, so repetitive, and then we have random sequences we're going to call spacer DNA and these are found uh, between genes that are close to each other sort of one after the other and so there are classes of genes that are organized in our genomes like that so for example the ribosomal RNA genes located on a couple of our chromosomes and there's hundreds of them and they're one after the other after the other after the other and this between them is the spacer DNA, and the spacer DNA itself is not transcribed. Okay, so I'm going to kind of work through mapping out, giving, you know, of course, some of you are, like to think of yourself as visual learners, right? So <laughs> it really helps to have somebody who knows how to illustrate something to help make the visual useful. So we'll, we'll try this. So we're looking at our nuclear genome, and we can divide them into the three basic kinds of DNA elements, those that are found only in single copy, those that are found in multiple copies, and then the spacer DNA, right? So the single copy, uh, they're further broken down into DNA elements like the coding sequences themselves, and then also the non-coding regions, the regulatory sequences and the introns. Looking at DNA presented in more than one copy, we can divide it into functional sequences and sequences with no known function. Functional sequences can be repeated over and over again or dispersed throughout the genome. So for example, supergene families, those are going to be dispersed throughout the genome. The supergene family is the idea that while we have 20,000 genes, protein coding genes, many of the genes uh, resemble each other. And so that suggests a mechanism of how those genes came about. Gene duplication. So that's something we'll talk about later. Uh, gene families and their pseudogenes. Okay, so this is again a smaller subset of the idea of the supergene families. And then gene families can range from the sequences are virtually identical all the way up to Basically, they have similar function, but the sequences themselves are quite different. Okay, and then going over to the sequences that don't have function, you have the interspersed and then the repeated in tandem. Repeated in over and over again, these are different kinds of transposons. And then the other ones that are interspersed, of course, are the pseudogenes. Highly repeated in tandem, microsatellites, 
and the other satellites okay so th this is kind of hard to follow just through the video so there's a link to this image on our website and so um, hopefully this will be of some use to you all right so this next slide just records basically the types of DNA elements and their relative distribution throughout the genome okay so this is the sort of the distillation of that graph so let's go ahead and stop there and then we'll pick up with types of genetic maps on Monday